Today we're taking a look at section 13.4, which is the costs and advantages of home ownership. Um, and there are both, and we'll highlight both of those things along the way. Uh, so some, some definitional things, um, and most of what's in this first part, we've actually seen these definitions before, and they line up exactly like we've seen before. Mortgage. Mortgage is just a home loan. Um, it's for a substantial amount of time, uh, amounting, amount of money over a lengthy time interval. Um, it's also sometimes called a deed of trust or a security deed. So you might hear it referred to that way. Um, down payment. Um, we've heard down payment before, and it means exactly the same thing we've seen. It's the portion of the purchase price that you pay up front. Term. That one's new. We actually haven't heard that word before. Term is just the length of the loan in years. Okay? So for mortgages, um, length of loans in years, there are three that are the most common. 15-year notes, 20-year notes, and 30-year notes. There are other options, but those are the three that are usually used, those three. And then the principal amount of the mortgage is simply the amount that you're financing, just like what we mean when we talk about principal in other situations. The amount of the loan is found by taking the purchase price minus the down payment. Okay, so far so good. All the definitions match the same. We just got the new one that means term. All right, a little bit more. Um, we are first going to be talking about something called a fixed rate mortgage. Um, depending on if and when you printed these notes out, there's a couple of things I made adjustments on last night around 9 o'clock, so I'll make mention of it in case you printed them out before 9 o'clock last night, which if you've printed them, you probably did. Um, so a fixed rate mortgage, the interest rate is fixed. That word was left out of the original first notes, so just want to enter it. It's not the interest that's fixed, as in it's the same amount of interest every payment. It's the rate of the interest that's fixed. And it stays constant the entire length of the tone. That's what fixed rate means, is that the rate doesn't change. And you might be saying, no, wait a minute, like there's loans where the rate does change? And the answer is yes, yes there are. We'll talk about them at the end. Amateurizing is the process by which the initial balance, together with the interest due on the loan, is repaid to the lender through regular, constant, periodic, typically monthly payments. So when you go and you get a home loan, they give you an, what they call an amortization schedule. And what it does is it shows you every single monthly payment in a row. Okay, so if you have a 30-year note, 30 times 12 is 360 months. You'd pay it out over 360 months, at least that would be the way the loan is written and it would tell you every piece of information so that it would be like a spreadsheet that's 360 lines long. Okay, that's what an amateurization schedule looks like, and the amateurizing is the process by which the schedule is created. All good? Okay, we're gonna do an example. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, two more notes before the example. I apologize. Regular monthly payments. This is new. We've not seen how to calculate this before, so this is something brand new. Uh, regular monthly payments. The payment required to repay the loan of P dollars He's the principal, together with the interest rate at an annual rate R, R percent, we've seen that before too, R is the percentage, over a term of T years, T is in years, just like we've seen before. The formula itself we have not seen. So this is calculated by taking the principal times R divided by 12. We divide it by 1 minus, and then we've got 12 over 12 plus R raised to the 12 T. And just like with some of our other formulas, we're going to need to be very cautious as we do this, make sure our calculator does what we're trying to tell it to do or think we're telling it to do in the right order. Because if it does in the wrong order, we're gonna get wrong answers and then things go, go awry. Um, <clears throat> when you close on a house, you don't just bring down payment. You bring also something called closing costs. Now part of your closing cost is the down payment. But there's other things that you might have to pay for as well. Um, and those are things that are sometimes negotiated between the seller and the buyer. So you might have to pay for some or all of inspection costs, right? You want to make sure that you're not getting a house that's got something significantly wrong with it. That would be a problem, right? Um, you might have to pay part of the um, realtor fees if there's realtor fees associated. Again, something that's negotiated when you make the um, offer on the house. So closing costs includes more than just down payments. Um, that phrase can include other fees as well. There's often a, a title fee, a fee that actually changes the title from the previous owner's name into your name, those kinds of stuff too, okay? 
So those are called closing costs. All right, so we're going to do some examples, um, um, some pieces along the way. We're going to go back to our friends Ann and Andy. They're ready to buy a home. Um, and they find a house, they negotiate their price, and their purchase price is $120,000. So um, they, hopefully along the way, have talked with some kind of a lending institution. There's different kinds of lending institutions. They'll offer different rates. Some companies are just mortgage companies. That's all they do. Uh, we have a friend who's a mortgage broker only. That's all they do is mortgages. Um, you can talk about credit unions or banks. Um, those are places that do other kinds of loans as well, and they'll offer home loans. Okay, so they've got uh, they're going with their credit union. They're being offered um, to loan out um, or to borrow a hundred thousand dollars. It's a fixed rate mortgage. The ones we've been talking about have been fixed rate already. It's three point seven five percent interest rate, and it's a twenty year note. So they're going to pay it out in twenty years. Okay, do you understand the details to start with? Is that okay? Right, so those details change based on lots of things, right? The interest rate they get, how much they can borrow, these things are affected by how much money they make, uh, how much other debt they already have, right? Do they owe on a car and a school loan? Well, that's gonna mean that they can't borrow as much, right? Um, it's going to, also sometimes it's affected by your, um, your credit, right? How, how well you have paid off other debt. Or if you haven't had credit, you can still get a loan. They'll do what's called manual underwriting, and which means they'll look at your um, ability to make other payments, like pay rent if you've rented an apartment, or pay on your cell phone, or your um, like gas or electric, um, you know, your your internet bills, things like that. They look at your how how regularly you make your payments and do you make them on time. Okay, so there's other things that go into that play. Another one that you might not be aware of is that sometimes they look at how long you have been in the profession that you're in. Are you brand new starting out doing this and it's your job? They might not be able to loan you money at all because they want to know that you're really going to stick with that job. You're not going to just get fired or quit because you don't like it. So that will actually come into play too. So these are the conditions that they have. Our first question is what their down payment is. Okay, so how can we figure out their down payment on their home? Seth? Subtract the principal with what the credit union is giving them, so that would be Right, so not the principal, but the because it's because that's 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 part of it. But the uh, the principal is the amount the credit union is allowing you to borrow. But the purchase price is what you want. Okay, yeah. So the purchase price of the of the home that they negotiated was one hundred twenty thousand dollars, and we're going to take off the amount that they're actually going to keep um, as a loan or borrow from, and that's the hundred thousand dollars, and that's going to give us the down payment that they need to bring to closing, plus whatever other closing costs that they've negotiated. $20,000. Okay, good so far? Okay, next thing we're going to do, I believe, is to find our regular monthly payment. So let me write down the regular monthly payment formula on this screen just so that we have it um, closer by than our previous um, slides. Number 12 divided by 1 minus 12 over 12 plus R the 12T. Um, we're going to identify all of the pieces of information that we need. Uh, there's three different quantities here. There's P, there's R, and there's T. So P, principal, the loan. How much are they borrowing? 100000 100, So our P is going to be 100000 R, our interest rate as a decimal. 0.0375. Right, so as a percent, it was 3.75%, but we don't want the percent value, what do we want to put, to put this in as? We want the decimal that corresponds to it, 0 0.0375. And then T, what is T? 20 for our 20 years, correct. Is everybody good with identifying those pieces from the information given? Perfect. So we're going to put these into this formula, and we're going to be a little bit cautious with our calculator, make sure um, that your calculator um, does what you're expecting it to do. And so we have our principal, that's 100,000, times our interest rate, 0 0.0375, divided by 12. All of that is divided by 1 minus 12 over 12 plus 0 0.0375. 
all raised to the 12 times t, which is 20. So grab a calculator out if you don't already have it out. And I'm going to make a few suggestions. It may or may not be necessary for your exact calculator. That's fine if it's not. But I do want to make sure that as we sort of process through this, um, that we're getting the same answers. So that if there's not, I can look at your calculator. We can adjust anything we need to. So I always, <laughs> I always take exponents and I just figure out what they're supposed to be, just because I don't want that to be a mistaking point, um, and it sometimes can be. So 12 times 20 is what? 240. 240. So my exponent is 240. Um, if you're using your calculator to find approximations for different pieces, which you may be, um, I would strongly suggest you keep lots of decimals. And by lots of decimals, I usually mean at least six. So I tend to keep six. Six and it seems to be sufficient without it being too many, um, but it, enough that I'm not going to have a decimal error at the end. So if I take my numerator and I do 100,000 times 0 0.0375 over 12, it ends up being a nice number. That is to say, it's a terminating decimal. It doesn't have like a complete um, continuation of decimals that you know, continues on the screen the whole way. It's just 312.5. So that's kind of nice. Um, the next fraction, though, is not as nice. Um, the denominator is just 12.0375, right? I'm adding 12 and 0 0.0375. If you take 12 and you divide by 12.0375, it's ugly and it goes all the way across the screen. And my calculator says 0.996884 Lots and lots of decimals. Okay? What I would do is to do that in my calculator and then go ahead and raise it to the power 240. Just leave it exactly in that ugly, you know, exp uh, expansion that it is and just go raise it to the power 240. And then I'm going to write that number down here. So I have 1 minus, and I'm going to write it down with 6 decimals. So I have point Four seven two nine one nine. Did anybody get to this point and not get point four seven two nine one nine? Okay, we're all good. Okay, great. Now we're gonna do one minus that for my denominator. So we've got the same three twelve on top. Point five or five zero. And my denominator is now 0 0.527081. So we have. And then we're going to divide. 312.5 divided by that. And I have 592. And this is dollars, right? This is our payment, so I need two decimals. And I have 89 cents. Anybody not get that as the answer when your calculator did its processing? Mine didn't like the uh, total letter, 12 plus 0.0. I'm trying again to see if I did something wrong. Okay, let's see. Calculator-wise, yeah. Mine's doing the same thing. It's not yeah. giving you. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So this is what I was talking about. You need to add these to your calculator. Thinks it wants to do 12 divided by 12. But you don't. You want to do about half, add
questions and calculator stuff. Okay. Um, so this is another one of those places where I added a little bit of a description in there to your notes. Um, I realize the word conservative is in here and I don't want to confuse conservative, which is used in lots of contexts to mean different things. Uh, and financial, conservative means cautious. Yes. How many decimal points should we write out? I write six. Uh, when I tell, whenever I write decimals out, I write six to make sure I don't get any um, inaccuracies. Um, so conservative. So a conservative or a cautious estimate for home ownership is to use a 15-year fixed mortgage with 20% down payment, which is close to what they did. They give $20,000 on a $120,000 note and all, no more than 25% of your monthly take-home pay. Um, if you go to a lender, your lender is perfectly happy to let you borrow more than 25% of your take-home pay, and it's a really risky thing to do that. Um, so you may or may not have heard the phrase house poor, but house poor describes someone who has borrowed more on their house, and then they don't have any money to go and do the things that they wish they could do, like on vacation um, or um, eat out, you know, that kind of stuff, because everything's going towards the house. Um, lenders will allow you to borrow almost up to 50% of your take-home pay for house and all your debt payments. It's huge. Don't do it. Um, when we moved to Ohio, my husband and I took out far too big of a loan because he didn't have a job yet, and we just felt sure he was going to get a job. It's going to be no problem. He did, but it wasn't the kind of job that we expected at the time, and it was really, really difficult because we had borrowed more than we should have for that point in our life. So this is actually a very safe kind of a um, mortgage to take. Um, we're going to complete a mortgage amortization schedule, but just for the first two months. So this is what an amortization schedule would look like. It's going to have columns for your payment numbers. So for this couple, they've got a 20 year note. Um, so you've got 20 years, 12 months a year, 240, right? That's how many monthly payments if they paid the whole thing out. So if they were going to closing, they would get a big old giant spreadsheet that would be 240 lines long that would look like this, and we're only gonna do the first two lines, okay? Um, it would include the payment amount. This column that says total payment, that's what we did on part B. So jot yourself down a note. Whatever you got from part B, that was our regular payment amount, is going to go in the payment column, and every number in the payment column is gonna be exactly the same, all the way down this line. So that was 592.89. So it would, you're right. Um, and so I would be going back to look for partial credit to see if I could see a trail that caused a problem so that it wouldn't affect the entire problem. Okay. Yes. Um, interest payment. So we're going to talk about how we calculate the interest payment, but it's going to look like something you've seen before. That's always good news. We've already done this, right? So we're going to look specifically at month one. And um, month two will be very similar, but there will be an adjustment factor, and I'll show you. So when we're looking at interest, you've calculated interest before. Your interest formula is I equal PRT. You remember that, right? Simple interest. Well, P, the principal, how much did we borrow? 100,000. 100, that's our P. R, our rate, what was our rate? Yep, 0 0.0375. It's the same values from our previous part of the problem. And then T for time. So this is a month payment. So how much is a month of a year? 1 12th. So this is 1 12th that goes in here. That's how much of a year we're talking about. T is always time in years. And if you do... If you multiply and divide this out, you'll actually get the numerator that we got back on the regular monthly payments side slide on part B. It's 312.50. OK? 
Okay, that's what we had over here as our numerator because it's the same calculation. Will it always be the numerator? Mm -hmm. For the first month, not for the second, but for the first month, yeah. So this 31250 is what goes in the second blank on the amortization schedule, 31250. Now, 31250 will not go in underneath the 31250. It will be different. Okay, so the only two rows that are going to match exactly is the first one right here, where it's going to say 59289 all the way down the amortization schedule as far as we went. 31250. Okay, so the next thing we're supposed to find, um, so this is our interest payment, is the principal payment. Okay, so when we make the payment to the bank, there's two components of the payment. One part is actually paying off the loan. That's the principal payment. That's what we're about to figure out. The other part is the luxury of borrowing money, the interest part. But these two things together have to add up to my total payment. Nod your head if that makes sense. Okay? All right. So my total payment is the 592.89. The interest part is 312.50. How can I figure out how much of the loan is actually get paid off? You got it. So my principal payment, I'm just going to write print payment, is the regular payment amount, right, the first column that I filled in, total payment, minus the interest column. So in a very real sense, I'm taking these two and I'm subtracting them to get the principal payment. Does that make sense? So I have 592.89. Minus 312.50. And what will that give me? Two eighty and thirty nine cents. And that's going to go right here. So even though I'm paying almost six hundred dollars, the loan actually doesn't go down by $600, right? The loan, the amount that I am actually still owing to the bank, only goes down by $280. So I borrowed $100,000. Now I've paid off $280. And if I subtract those two, that's going to tell me my last column. How much do I still owe? So to figure out how much I still owe, the balance on the account... I take my current loan that I owe, the loan value, whatever it is, right now it's 100,000, and I subtract off the principal payment. So again, for us right now, it's $100,000 that I owe minus the 280, uh, 39, is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, 39 that I paid off. So 100,000 minus 280.39, what do I get? $99,719.69. Okay, so that's how much I still owe after the first time I make a payment to my mortgage. $99,719.61. Thank you, 61. Okay, does that make sense? Made my first payment. I paid almost 600, but the loan payment only went down by about 300 because that's how much went towards principal. Everything else just paid the bank for the luxury of borrowing their money. Kind of stinks. Interest is just rough, man. Especially on big payments, right? Like a mortgage. Such a large payment for such a long period of time. That's why the interest adds up so quickly, or at least feels like it's so large. Okay, this is month one. Month two is a little different because on month two, I don't owe the bank $100,000 anymore. I owe the bank $99,719.61. So that's the value that I use to calculate my interest. So when I go into month two and I'm calculating my interest, I won't write the formulas down anymore. We'll just write down the calculations since they're already on this screen. The principal now is no longer $100,000 because I don't owe $100,000 anymore. I only owe 99719 or Ann and Andy do, 61 
and I multiply that principal, but the rate and the time are still the same. The rate is still 0 0.0375, and it's still for one month time, one twelfth. That's how long of a time period we're calculating based on. So it's February, if you wish, or whatever, but it's one twelfth of the year. What do you get for your interest payment in month two? Three eleven sixty two. How does that compare with month month with month one? Almost a dollar less. Almost a dollar less. But it is less, right? Why should it make sense that it's less? Because there's less principal. My interest is calculated on a smaller principal amount. Does that make sense? And if less of it is going to interest, which it is, right? Three twelve down to three eleven, almost a dollar less. If less of it is going to interest, how much is going to principal? A dollar more. A dollar more, approximately, right? A little bit more. So if you were looking at an amortization schedule like many lines of it, what you would see is this interest payment column would decrease all the way down, right? Every month it would be a little bit less. And this principal payment column would increase all the way down. Every month it would be a little bit more. You're making a little bit more progress every month you go. And it's interesting because even as you go into the loans further, they still don't change that much. I mean, we're toward the end of our loan. We have like four years left on our loan, three to four years left on our loan, depending on if we can pay it off faster. It still only changes my interest and my pay principal payment. Like this is changing by about a dollar a month, right? Yeah, about. Ours is only changing by like three or four dollars a month. Hardly at all. I mean, it's still significantly, like it's, it gets better every month, right? but not fast. <laughs> it's not a fast progress process. It just isn't. So how can we find out our principal payment then? Subtract yeah. So we still take the same 592 because that's still what we're paying, right? 592.89. And now we subtract the new interest payment for month two, 311.62. What is it? 281.27. And how can we figure out what our new balance is? Subtract the 281.27 from the 99719. Right. So the 99719, which is what we entered the month owing. And we subtract the principal amount, the 281.27. So again, the way we're finding this next piece right here is to take the previous line, the balance, subtracting off our principal payment. What do we get? It's still 99,000 something. 99,438. Does this process make sense? Okay, so the mathematics here is really not complicated. It's really like addition, subtraction, and multiplication. That's all we're doing on this whole slide, right? But you have to make sure you're subtracting and adding and it has to be all the right quantities as you go. Now, you may have heard people say um, things like it's cheaper to own or to purchase a home than it is to rent. Have you heard that before? Okay. So what they're usually meaning is they're usually meaning the, this payment, this total payment that you're making toward the cost of the home is less than the cost you pay to landlord and rent. But you have to be a little bit careful because there are some hidden costs or maybe like not thought about costs of home ownership that don't calculate in quite like this. And there's two of them that we're going to talk about. Three, actually. So sorry. But two that we can actually give numbers to. One of them is property taxes. Property taxes are collected by a county or other local government. Sometimes you have city taxes. Oklahoma doesn't have city taxes, but when we lived in Ohio, we did. Um, so you have property taxes uh, counted here in Oklahoma by your county. Uh, it can cost up to several thousand dollars annually, and it can change. 
Um, so your property taxes can change based on your school district and any kind of things that they put in, like bonds, right? You guys know, you've heard school bonds. You probably had some when you were in high school and so forth. People pass bond issues. Um, our school board in our area passed a bond issue. Our property taxes went up $1,000 last year. $1,000. A lot of money. So, so it's a good question. Is it done annually or monthly? It depends. So um, we're going to talk about one way that it's done monthly. We're going to think about it for, as a monthly expense kind of quantity here. Um, but you can pay it annually. My husband and I pay ours annually. That sounds expensive. It is expensive. It's quite a, quite a thing when you get something that's $1,000 more than you're expecting in the mail. Um, property taxes um, and mortgage interest are both tax deductible. Uh, what that means is that let's just say you as an individual made $45,000 and you paid $3,000 in your property taxes. Well, then the government would say, well, you don't have to pay taxes on $45,000. We'll subtract the $3,000 off. You only have to pay it on $42,000 now. That's what it means to be tax deductible. It just means you don't pay taxes on that amount of money. It doesn't mean you save that amount of money on your taxes. That's a misconception. Okay? You just don't pay the taxes on that amount. Um, homeowner's insurance. Uh, and property taxes can vary based on, I mean, the individual neighborhood in which you live. You live in a very, um, you know, like costly neighborhood, you're going to pay more in your property taxes. Um, this year we paid more in our property taxes because of the levy that was, um, or bond issue that happened at our school district, right? But next year it'll go back down, like we know that. Um, so it, it fluctuates based on your actual location and cities and states too. So our property taxes in Ohio were considerably higher, if I remember right, but our homeowner's insurance was considerably lower when we lived in Ohio compared to Oklahoma. Homeowner's insurance now. Homeowner's insurance covers losses due to things like fire, storm damage, tornadoes, hail. That's like storm damage, but hail's a big one in Oklahoma. My father was a roofer. We prayed for hail. Hail was good for business. <laughs> and insurance usually paid it. It was great. Um, it also pays if somebody gets hurt on your property. Did you know that if the neighborhood kid's over at your property and they break their arm that you're liable for that? You are. Not you personally, but your homeowner's insurance is actually liable for that. So it actually covers those kinds of things too, which we don't always think about. So if you own a home, you are, and, you, and you loan money especially, you are required to have homeowner's insurance, and believe me, you want it. You lose your home in a fire. My parents lost their home in a fire uh, when I was a high, senior in high school, actually. We lost everything. Uh, you want somebody helping you to take care of those expenses. It's a huge deal. Yeah. How did they like calculate? Is it just like off your word what was in the house if everything gets burned down? So when you go and you actually get a policy, um, you work out with them what you believe the property values are of the things in your home, and you you work with them. Usually, the way it works is that you have a certain amount of value based on the property value of the like the actual value of the dwelling. So if your dwelling is one hundred fifty thousand dollars in your dwelling cost, there's a percentage that they use that covers the contents of the home. So then you would come back and you would actually have that amount of percentage, especially if it was a total loss, to replace things. They don't look at it like item by item like that, but more like, and then if you have expensive items, you have to have a special like rider like for jewelry or you know, coins or something like that. It also covers your um, property in your car if your car were thefted. So if you had a break-in in your car, then your homeowner's insurance would cover the property that you own in your car that was stolen. Yeah. Could that change over time? Definitely. Like, um, gain more value in your home? Yeah. yeah, like right now, property values are joint, just going through the roof. I don't know if you guys know this, but it's very expensive to go purchase a home right now. So like our home's property has gone up in value. So when we got our homeowner's insurance quote this year, it was $1,000 more. I don't know why 1000 is the magic number this year, but apparently it just is. It was a thousand dollars more in our property value than it was, the, or our, our homeowners insurance than it was the year before. Um, but that's the point when you should probably call around and check insurance rates too, and make sure that you don't want to switch companies or something like that. Um, so homeowners insurance in Oklahoma is pretty expensive. Any idea why? Natural weather. Natural weather. We got the tornadoes thing. We got the hail damage. We got all the weather stuff going on in here. So like when we were in Ohio, they will sometimes get tornadoes, but like it's few and far between. So property damage due to weather, like you're saying, it just doesn't happen as much. Wind is another one, you bet. So we get that. Maintenance. Maintenance is a big one that people do not think about, which is absolutely funny, uh, really, because it happens to everybody, right? Like, you, you've ever heard of Murphy's Law? If something can go wrong, it will. 
Um, and they usually occur in threes. I don't know why, but things just happen bad in threes. I don't know if they, they do to us in, in general. But, um, you know, the hot water heater will go out. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't want to shower in cold water. Right? you got to pay to replace the hot water heater. Um, the age of the home will affect that partly, right? Um, the different um, weather events. Like, we live in actually in a home that was completely damaged in a tornado, and then we bought the remnants of it afterwards. My father-in-law is a contractor, and he fixed it. Well, there are things that actually we keep finding that go wrong because it has been through a tornado because they didn't demolish it. There's different things, right? So like we have a water leak. Well, the water leak because there's corrosion because this happened, this happened. It was all tornado related from 12 years ago. That's what we have. Um, you know, so there's different effects um, that happen through and different things too. Like we live out kind of in the country. So we have a septic system and we have um, a water well. Well, there are upkeeps to septic systems and water wells that you don't have if you live in a city, right? I mean, there's just different things for different places. And if you're not the homeowner and you're renting it, then your landlord pays to fix those things. And if you own the home, you pay to fix those things. That's a cost of home ownership. Yeah. So say somewhere where there's like, say like on the bayou, like Louisiana, there's a lot of storms and stuff. You're probably paying a like, lot for your property yeah, insurance. Yeah, your homeowner insurance. Up, like, yep, they'll charge it up. And there also are different riders. Like flood insurance is generally not covered and earthquakes not uncovered. And so if you want those, you have to have a special rider on your policy to cover those things. We have a rider on our policy to cover earthquakes. We added it shortly after all the earthquakes started happening in Oklahoma a number of years ago. So we have a, a small rider that covers earthquake damage. Um, we don't live specifically in a place. We're the highest neighbor, like home in our neighborhood, so we don't have flood insurance. Um, but others around us might choose to because their, their, their properties are lower, you know, based on where we live in our neighborhood. So these things can affect. Um, so... If you have your money um, all paid to the bank, the bank will often do something called escrow. It's in an, uh, a, a description here in a minute. But it's actually uh, where you pay the bank your one monthly payment, and it covers three things, the amount that owes to the bank, the amount that owes to the homeowner's insurance, and the amount that owes to the state or the city or county or whatever for your property insurance. So that's what this next question is addressing, is the total monthly payment for Ann and Andy. Uh, their annual tax is 932 and their annual insurance is 660. So if we were to do this calculation, we would have their regular payment. That's what we've already calculated. Plus their monthly tax payment. <coughs> plus their monthly insurance. So the regular payment was 592.89. That's what we did on part B. Their tax is 932 for the year, so if you're thinking it from the monthly perspective, we would divide that by 12. That's their monthly tax liability, right? And then their insurance is 660. And again, we divide it by 12 if we wanted to know what that would be monthly. We can calculate each of these individually. So I have 592.89 plus... Um, the next one is actually 7767. It's rounded off, but it's okay because the next one's a whole number at 55. So the amount that they would actually make if they have their mortgage escrowed, which again we'll talk about that in a second, would be the sum of these, which is 72556. It's probably worth noting that if you don't own your home and you're simply renting, it's still a good idea to get renter's insurance because if the tornado completely demolishes the house and you don't have renter's insurance and you're renting, you lose all the property inside, all of your personal belongings, all of it's gone. Or if somebody steals it, it's all gone. And the property owner, like your landlord, would have the insurance to cover the dwelling, but you'd have nothing to cover your property. And renter's insurance is dirt cheap look into it. It's usually not much more to get your renter's insurance bundled with your car insurance than the car insurance all by itself. Super crazy stuff, okay? So you can have renter's insurance too. They call it homeowner policy, but it's for renting. I don't know why they call it that, but just so you know. Um, all right, so some financial advisors will actually suggest that you shouldn't pay off your home early. You should pay it out because you get this, uh, you know, like tax break. Um, where they take, remember I gave you an example, your $45,000 that you make minus the amount that you pay towards your property tax in a year and your homeowner's insurance in a year, and you don't pay it on there. So we're going to actually look at this um, and consider it. And it doesn't really matter what constraints I use, so I've just picked some right here to kind of give us an idea. 
This is Ann and Andy. There is an adjustment that I've made. This just says in the first year. It just says in a given year or something like that in your notes if you printed it off um, last night before I adjusted it. So just write it, say, in the first year. So we've already talked about how we find interest. It's PRT, right? The principal for the first year, and again, with the negligible um, change, dollar a month change, it's $100,000 that we owe at the beginning of the year for the principal. The interest rate is 0 0.0375, and we're looking at a one-year time frame. So this isn't exactly how much we would pay in interest. It would be a little bit less than this, but it gives us a good idea to make the decision about this question of whether or not it's a good idea to hang on to the mortgage or to pay it off if we could. So if you multiply these out, you're actually getting $3,750. So that's how much money you're paying to the bank for the luxury of owning the home um, with them being the financier, okay, $3,750. So we're going to assume, again, this is an assumption that they're in the 25% tax bracket. It may be more, it may be less. It really doesn't matter. We're going to find the same conclusion no matter what percentage I give you. So we're just going to go with 25%. So what this means is that $3,750 is part of their income that they're paying to the mortgage company, right? They pay it, and they don't have to pay taxes on it. So again, it doesn't mean that they don't pay $3,750 worth of taxes. They don't pay the taxes on the $3,750. The tax rate is 25%. So if they were paying taxes on it, they'd pay 25% of the $3,750 to the government. So what is 3750 times 0.25? 937. Okay. So they do pay $937.50 less in taxes because of this. So obviously, like, we want to do that if we have to owe the money and we can't pay it all off anyway. Like, yeah, absolutely, let's not send the government an extra $1,000, right? Cool. We're good with that. That's not the question, though. The question is, if we had the ability to just pay it off, would we choose to not pay it off? So the question really, really like boils down to, Ann and Andy are paying the credit union $3,750. And assuming they could pay it off and they didn't have to pay the $3,750, they would lose the tax credit that's the nine, what was it, 37? 50 cents. 50 cents. So they're paying the credit union $3,750 to avoid paying the government $937.50. Is that a good move? No. no. Not if they could pay it off, right? Right. And the reality is if they really wanted to avoid sending the government the $1,000, they could pay the $3,750 to their church and have the same tax deduction. Any 501c3, in fact, any charitable organization they could do that with and they would have still the same tax deduction. So no, if you can pay the house off, pay the house off. You don't want to pay the interest payments. The interest payments are always going to exceed the amount that you're paying in taxes, always. Because the interest payments is 100%. The tax savings is whatever your percentage is of your tax bracket you're in. All right, I want to show you a few more details here. I'm going to run through them really quickly. Um, actually, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to do the ones that I can. I'm going to do them a little bit slowly, and then I'll post a second video, and then you can watch it. I ran through them really quickly, and I don't think anybody listened to anything I said in the last five minutes of class in the last class period. So I, these are important features. You're not actually going to have any questions related to them. The reason I want you to know about them is because it's really like part of your real future stuff. Like this matters. It matters beyond this class in significant ways. I've mentioned escrow a couple of times. Es <coughs> excuse me. Escrow is a reserve account maintained by the mortgage lender. So what the escrow company does is the escrow company at closing has you pay, you know, your closing costs. And what they usually have you pay is a year's worth of insurance and a year's worth of property taxes up front. Okay? And then monthly or yearly or whatever, they make payments to, your, to the government to pay for these things for you. But they keep these monies in the bank for you, and then you make monthly payments for the next year. Okay. It simplifies it for the lend or for the uh, borrower because they only make the one payment instead of the three separate payments. I mean, there's, there's a nice factor to it. But make no mistake, the lending institution is making interest on the money that you've put there because they get to keep it for a year and get the interest on it, and you don't. But that's the way escrow works. Okay? Some companies will require you to do escrow. You don't have a choice, and sometimes you do. 
we do not have our mortgage interest, uh, or our mortgage, not mortgage, our homeowner's insurance and our um, property taxes escrowed. We pay them ourselves. And I just have a line in my budget where I just add money monthly. At the end of the year, I just pay it, and I keep the interest on my money because I feel comfortable doing that at this point. We didn't do that all the time. When we were young, we did escrow. Adjustable rate mortgage. Uh, I mentioned early on that we were talking about fixed rate mortgages. There are also something called adjustable rate or variable rate mortgages. They do not have a fixed interest rate over time. Generally, they start lower than the fixed rate, so they look very enticing. They're like, ooh, I can get a 1% and a three, instead of the 3.75% interest rate. But there's always a catch. It can change. That's what it means to be adjustable or variable. And it will change periodically. Huh? You, there won't be questions. But you need to know that if you were to ever think to do this, there's a lot of things to consider. So let me go through this one slide and then we'll stop. There's an adjustment period. How frequently can they change your interest rate? Do they change it every year, every three years, every five years? You should know. If you're signing up for this, you should know how quickly can your interest rate change. The index, the standard fluctuating average, is the basis for the new adjusted average. So if the interest rates on fixed mortgages go up, then when they have the ability to change your variable rate, it's going to go up too. If the interest rates on fixed mortgages go down, then your interest on your variable is going to go down too. Right? So it fluctuates with the fixed rates. The margin is the additional amount added to the index by the lender. Right? They're going to give themselves a buffer. If the mortgage rates in general are going down, well, they don't want them to go down so far that they're still not making money on you with this flexible rate. Right? That's the margin. And then the discount is the amount by which the initial rate may be less than the sum of the index or the margin. They might give you a discount because you've done such a good job of paying everything on time. Or they simply you know, are trying to gain your business instead of somebody else getting it. There's a competition going on. That's called a discount rate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pause. I'm going to let you guys leave. I'm going to finish talking this out. And it'll be like five more minutes. And then you can go and you can listen to the five more minutes as it pertains to your future. OK? All right, so a few more kind of definitional things if you're popping back in and listening with me um, that are affecting arms um, is an index cap rate. So this is the limit on the interest rate like and how, how much it can increase um, uh, overall. And then the periodic cap, the limit per adjustment period. For example, um, if you are allowed to increase your um, rate every year, can you increase it 1%? Um, that's kind of typical or for, uh, for a six month time frame, or 2% per year. But it could fluctuate what, we're, what your mortgage allows. And so it's something to keep in mind if you decide to go this route, that you should look into it. Arms are really dangerous um, in the sense that they have a lot of flexibility. You put yourself in, in a kind of precarious situation um, when you take on this kind of a, of a fluctuating loan. Uh, the overall cap is the limit on rate increases over the life of the loan. For example, let's say you did sign up for a 1% mortgage on an arm. Um, there's going to be a limit on how much they can raise the overall mortgage rate, the interest rate period. Um, so it's typically about 5%. Again, it could be different based on the terms of your mortgage, um, You know the conditions. The conditions of your mortgage might say that it can only raise 4%, or maybe it can raise 6%, but there's always going to be a cap on how much they can actually increase that rate that they're offering you at the beginning. The payment cap is the limit on how much the payment can increase at each adjustment. Obviously, that's related to the um, interest rate, um, but there's a cap on the, on the amount that your payment can go up at each adjustment period as well. We have three more. Um, the next one is the, mo the most scary, really, uh, and we actually had some friends for whom this happened. They had an arm. Um, this is when we were living in Ohio, and they had negative amortization. Uh, negative amortization actually means that your payments are not even covering the interest amount. And so instead of your um, principal going towards the payment of um, you know, paying off that, like that $100,000 loan, you don't even cover the interest amount itself. So your mortgage amount increases over time rather than decreases over time. This is not a good place to be. 
it means that over time you're not actually paying off the home mortgage. In fact, you're increasing the amount that you owe. Super scary stuff. Um, all of these um, you know, variable rates typically have some convertible features to them. Uh, and what happens is that there's a, a contract that says that at certain intervals, certain designated points of time, you can change to a fixed rate mortgage. So say, for example, um, there came a point when you, know, you were fairly certain that those fixed rates that were currently happening are just, they bottomed out. They're not getting any lower. And you'd really like to jump on board because it's only going up from here. I mean, that's kind of where we are right now. I mean, like the interest rates are going up. And if you had an arm right now and had the ability to change it to a fixed rate mortgage, it might be in your best interest to do so because what you would be doing is fixing your mortgage at the low interest rate while everything is expected to increase afterwards, including the variable rate that you have. So this allows you um, some, some choices and some timeframes and so forth to change from an arm to a fixed rate or a variable rate, you know, or an adjustable rate or a, a variable rate mortgage to a fixed rate mortgage. And then the last one, the prepayment penalty. Um, this seems sort of counterintuitive that it would be the case. Uh, we have talked about this before, but a prepayment penalty is a penalty for paying things off early. And not that every mortgage has these, but some do, and they actually charge you money if you pay off your mortgage early. Why would they do that? Well, because as long as you're paying off your mortgage slower, they're getting more in interest. So it may be advantageous to them, in fact, it would be advantageous to them as the lender to impose a penalty on you as the buyer to pay off your loan early. 